welcome everybody to the Art of Fridays. It's going to be the last one of the season. We're going to restart in September. It's really hot here in London, so we're all dying of heat. I'm not, I'm Brazilian. But anyway, our speaker today is Professor Mazena Simanska, and I'm very pleased she has accepted the invitation because she is not an art scientist, but she is someone who has large experience on many body systems away from equilibrium. And this is something that our community is interested in learning. So Professor Simanska is a theoretical physicist exploring emergent phenomena in far from equilibrium quantum systems, especially quantum fluids of light. She obtained her PhD from Cambridge 2002, held research fellowships at Cambridge and Oxford colleges from 2002 to 2007, EPSSC postdoctoral fellowship in Oxford before moving to Warwick as a lecturer in 2007. And then she joined physics and astronomy department at UCL in 2013, where she is now a professor and she is also an EPSSC fellow. So uh, we're going to hear from her today. She's going to talk about novel non equilibrium phenomena in quantum fluids of light. Thank you so much uh, for joining us, Zena. And uh, we are ready to go if you are. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm, I'm really delighted to, uh, to give the, uh, my presentation in this very, very famous and well attended always uh, webinar. Um, so thank you, Carla and, uh, and Carla's group for the, for the invitation. So now I will, I will try to share my screen. So as Carla mentioned, I'm, I'm not an astrophysicist, but I still work on uh, on, on light, and, and in particular, we work on uh, many body physics with light. And uh, today I will talk about some um, of, of a new non-equilibrium phenomena which can be observed in, in so-called quantum fluids of light, which are not possible in, in equilibrium systems. So before I start, I would like to acknowledge my group in UCL. The, the photo is a little outdated. We are now, due to COVID, not able to take a, a, a kind of more fresh photo of, of our group. So some people left and there are also new people in my group. But in particular, I would like to thank Alex, Paolo and uh, Cristobal, uh, whose um, the projects I will be presenting and, and also the, the funding from EPSRC and, and the EU network. Uh, we have a, we have a EU, EU network with experimental groups in Europe within the Quantera program. Um, okay, so let's let's start with a brief introduction. So, what do we mean by interacting photons and 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 kind of building a many body uh, systems out of light? Well, so so in the in the last uh, I would say maybe twenty years, uh, there has been um, a lot of interest in uh, making photons interact via uh, coupling it to some nonlinear nonlinearities in the medium. So um, these systems range from semiconductor polaritons to cold atoms in cavities, circuit heat systems. So it was a, a whole range of experimental realizations where uh, photons are made to interact by coupling to some matter component. And in our group, we, we looked at the range of phenomena such as non-equilibrium phase transition, critical phenomena, out of equilibrium, non-equilibrium superfluidity, topological transitions and defects. Um, but following that uh, uh, developments in experiments, uh, recently, I would say in the last five years, uh, five, seven years, uh, there is a new area emerging, and this is quantum solids of light, where now light, not only that is interacting, but one can put light photons, single photons, in fact, uh, into uh, periodic potentials. Um, for example, this is an example of a uh, honeycomb uh, lattice, um, very similar to, to that of graphene, but instead of electrons like in, 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 in the graphene, we have photons trapped in that lattice, and this is made by uh, a special growth and edging to create those, those micro pillars. So here it's like uh, zero dimensional, two dimensional, and this is three dimensional lattices of micro pillars. So we have a kind of a new area emerging where now we have interacting photons in periodic potentials. So uh, what are these systems? So as, I, as I mentioned briefly, we mainly, in our group, we mainly worked on semiconductor polaritons, uh, which means that um, one growth um, by MBA techniques, um, layered materials where excitons are 
um, trapped in, in a quantum well and then interact strongly with photons and form a new quasi-particles called polaritons. Um, and this polariton is an interacting boson. So you can form all kinds of um, fluid states or superfluids or condensates. Uh, it's, a, it's a boson, like, like a cold atom. But at the same time, obviously, even, um, even if uh, you, you grow these materials uh, uh, very well and there is a very long lifetime of photons in these cavities, the lifetime is never infinite. So there is always leakage of photons from the structure and one has to um, keep pumping the system in order to sustain some non-equilibrium steady state or, or equilibrium as a matter of fact, or, because there are, there are some, some systems, some structures where the lifetime is so long um, that thermalization time in the system is short, much shorter than the lifetime, which means we can even realize thermal equilibrium. And you can realize thermal equilibrium because I can for example, there. But a uh, particular interest in, in this talk is our non-equilibrium effect. So, so samples which, uh, which have a this drive and dissipation actually stronger than, than the thermalization time. So um, we, we mainly focus in our group on semiconductor polaritons. But we also worked a bit on photon BEC system or circuit KD systems, which are also very similar. Instead of, you also have photons, but instead of exciton, one would have uh, adjustment junctions and, and superconducting circuits, which also can be modeled as two-level systems. So it'd be theoretically very similar, but obviously experimentally, it's, it's a completely different setup. And also atoms and cavities have a very similar properties. So it's, it's a whole range of experimental realizations. And, um, Obviously, over the, the last 10 years, um, condensates and superfluids were realized in, in the systems. But um, we want to ask another question. So it's kind of first the community wanted to realize an equilibrium condensate. So tick a box that we have a BEC, we have a superfluidity in the system. So this has been done. But now we are asking questions. OK, can we engineer something novel, something which is not possible to do in equilibrium? And so in, in, in this talk, I will focus on, on, this, on this aspect. So to ask a question, can non-equilibrium, but also non-trivial phases be engineered? So, so something which is, uh, which is specific to non-equilibrium, which is not possible in equilibrium. So I will talk about a couple of problems. I will I, I'm not sure I will have time to, to talk about all of them, but I thought that instead of focusing in a great detail on a, on a one topic, since it's not a, um, a it's not a talk which is very specific to you know to the community to other community i thought it's much better to just give it a kind of more general overview of kind of more um, um more subjects rather than just focus on one in detail so i'll try to uh, to discuss that this driven dissipative photonic system uh, are an excellent example of uh, kpz physics so kadar uh, paris junk uh, equation physics uh, which is a universality class of a wide range of non-equilibrium system, but uh, it's now the version in the condensate is that the phase, which, which, which will obey the KPZ equation, is a compact variable. So we have a brand new system, KPZ with compact variable. And also because of drive and dissipation and, and some um, coupling to, to other degrees of freedom. So we have a quantum degree of freedom of a condensate, but we also have a classical degree of freedom of uncondensed excitons, for example, or some other particles. Uh, then we obtain a quite, uh, quite um, um, rich phase diagram. We have second order phase transition, but also first order phase transition with costless Taurus transition in between. So it's, it's quite a rich system and it's quite analogous to active matter. So actually, biological systems, which was very surprising for us to see. Um, so I will touch upon that. We also uh, observe experimentally and theoretically a BKT, so Beresinski causes the Stowless transition, but it's, it's, uh, it's quite different to the one in equilibrium. So we have some kind of unconventional BKT with features which are specific to, to the system. And also I talk about, if I have time, I talk about uh, superfluidity in, this, in the driven dissipative system because it's also quite complicated and a bit different uh, than in equilibrium. And then finally, if time permits, I will, um, I will discuss one topic which was done by my PhD student Cristobal, um, and namely now loading those polaritons into, into the honeycomb lattice and, and looking at condensation in the rotating state into the lowest lambda level of, of, the, of the straight graphene, which um, it, it's, it's a quite a new topic and um, we did 
a lot of theoretical analysis, but now we are working with experiments to, to try to observe this, this, this phenomenon. Okay, so first I will, I will talk about this, this first topic, which is uh, KPZ physics uh, with uh, a light matter system with polaritons. So why this KPZ is interesting? I mean, some of you may not even hear about it. So, um, uh, so it's, it's a mathematically um, a, a rich um, phenomenology, which um, for you, it was, um, I mean, mathematicians were awarded a, a 2014 Fields Medal for solving uh, KPZ equation uh, mat in, in mathematics. Um, and um, this equivalent, I mean, Fields Medal is equivalent of a Nobel Prize for, for mathematics. But the, the, the interest among physicists came from the fact that it's a universality class for a wide range of non equilibrium phenomena in 1D. So starting from uh, surface growth to burning papers to growth of bacterial colony, a lot of things are described by this uh, KPZ equation. However, to date, there was no clear experimental realization of KPZ in two dimensions. So, uh, you know, all of the experimental realizations are on the 1D, 2D, there were some suggestions, but so far there was no experimental realization in 2D. So um, it, it turns out that, I, I won't go obviously into the deviation of that, but it turns out that if you have a system of bosons with drive and dissipation, and the system is about to condense, so you, you will form a Bose-Einstein condensate or, or a, or a um, kind of costless towelless type of condensate, uh, then it has been shown that um, a phase dynamics of such a condensate is described by, um, by this type of nonlinear equation. Now, uh, these uh, terms which are uh, marked in, uh, um, I mean, in, in, in pink here are additional terms which come from only from drive and dissipation. So if a system will be closed, so if I have, let's say, Bose-Einstein condensate of cold atoms or some other conservative system, I won't have that those terms. So my, my phase dynamics in a Bose-Einstein condensate of cold atoms will just be given by the terms which are, which are in, in, in black, just, just the diffusion equation. But now we have terms which correspond to the gradient of the phase square here. So this is a novelty of a condensate which has a drive and dissipation of, in the system. So a kind of photonic condensate where, because as I said, photons are always um, escaping from the cavity, you always have to replenish them. And this, uh, this driven dissipative um, terms uh, are giving rise to this uh, KPZ nonlinearity. So it was very nice to, to discover. It was discovered in 2015 that this driven dissipative light matter condensate can be mapped to the KPZ equation. And what, what it means also for superfluidity, it means that uh, you could see, still see superfluidity in your systems, but the, at large distances, uh, the, uh, the, the first order coherence decays exponentially. It's actually a stretch exponential with a characteristic exponent, which is universal. So it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of new state of matter where you have a fast decay of coherence, faster than algebraic in, 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 a, in a true condensate, but superfluidity survives. So you have still exponential decay, so fast decay of coherence, but still the system is superfluid. So um, ever since, um, there was a very large interest in uh, among experimentalists to observe uh, this type of um, phenomena. However, we, um, the, so I mean, f first it was quite a lot of excitement that we can realize KPZ in 2D. So far, any possible examples were in 1D. So polariton systems or, or photon BC systems could be a first example of KPZ in 2D. However, uh, this excitement was a little cooled down by observation that if we, in a typical um, isotropic scenario, so if you have a system which is just incoherently pumped, is what they usually do in isotropically, then unfortunately, this KPZ order is not possible in the steady state in thermodynamic limit. And this was uh, basically due to the fact that my, our variable now, our theta, is a compact variable. So um, the KPZ equation is uh, usually um, formulated for problems where the variable is not a compact variable. It's, it's a, like crystal growth or bacterial colony. You can just take any value. But phase, as you know, winds from zero to two pi. And if you go further, it just winds back. Yes, so it's, it's a compact variable. And compact variable, what, what it means to have a compact variable is that you have vortices in the system and vortices can destroy your, your order. 
if you have vortices in the free vortices in the system, you don't have superfluidity. So, so it was then um, estimated, if one put realistic parameters to that system, to the system of equation, then the KPZ was either killed by vortices, so it led to exponential decay of correlation, so no superfluidity and no, no, no order whatsoever. Or if you wanted to make it, um, if you want to make a land scale smaller, so as I said, it was, it was, it was decided that KPZ order is not possible in steady state thermodynamic limit. So you could think, okay, I make my system small, so that the land scale for vortices is, is larger than the system size, so that I can get rid of those vortices and I can still see KPZ. But that was also uh, precluded if, if you really put uh, realistic parameters, uh, because uh, the KPZ length scales were always larger than um, uh, than the vortices length scales. So, so in some in somewhat, although the, the, the first kind of theoretical discovery uh, of KPZ in polaritons uh, was um, kind of led to pessimistic conclusion that. It cannot be observed experimentally because you'll be either killed by vortices, which leads to exponential decay of correlation, or you need the two large system sizes. So um, basically, within the system size, you always have a power law decay of correlation with the system size. So it would mean that you just have like an equilibrium condensate. So either I have a no condensate or an equilibrium condensate, but not this interesting non-equilibrium version with, with the KPZ. So wh why why was that the case? So then. So then um, a further analysis showed that this is the case because if you compute, um, if you estimate, if you want, a, a forces, so, so a potential between, uh, between vortices in an equilibrium condensate, you will see that you have attractive interaction between vortex and anti-vortex. So this is like in a classic XY model in two dimensions. Yes, so we, we know that uh, a BKT transition is a transition in an XY model, but it also is, is, a, is a phase transition in the condensate because the vortices attract each other. So uh, as I close the, um, the, the transition from disorder to the order phase, my vortices bind with anti vortex because they attract each other. And then finally they annihilate and one has a perfect coherence uh, as you cross the transition. However, it was discovered that in this case, when you have a drive and dissipation, actually the, uh, we got additional term and this additional term can be either repulsive or attractive, depending on anisotropy. So if the system is completely um, isotropic, like normally what we observe in, in an incoherently driven polariton system, this term would be negative. So what it means, and this, this term will dominate, if you look at the um, functional dependence, this term will dominate at large length scale, whereas this term will dominate at small length scale. So as you go to larger distances, the vortices will start repelling each other. So if you have a large system and you happen to create vortices there from some noise, they will not be able to annihilate because they will start repelling each other. So that was the, the kind of reason behind the fact that you could not really uh, observe uh, a KPZ because that it would be killed by vortices. However, if you add anisotropy, uh, the sign, finally, the sign of this term actually might change. So first, if you add anisotropy, this term might become smaller and smaller. And finally, if anisotropy in the system is very strong, then this, this term will change sign, and you actually have even larger attraction between, uh, between the, uh, the vortices, which will even enhance the kind of um, BKT uh, decay. So uh, if you do, um, so this, this was some kind of almost hand waving argument of um, <clears throat> some very approximate uh, theoretical analysis. So, so what we did uh, some time ago with Alex here is we did uh, an exact uh, um, simulation of the KPZ equation in our context of the compact KPZ equation uh, after quench. And what we see is that uh, in the steady state, indeed, you have this for isotropic case, you have this millions of vortices. If you zoom in, you, you see that you really don't have any coherence, any condensation, no possibility of order, because you, you generate lots of free vortices, they repel each other, they don't annihilate, you don't, you don't have a nice condensate. However, if you just change the sign, so you, 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 you take the same KPZ equation for the phase, but you just change the sign of anisotropy. So by, by that, I mean, um, if lambda x is equal to exactly minus lambda y. So you don't change the magnitude, but you just, just change this plus into minus. And the behavior is totally different. 
you really you, you don't have um, if you say you have a strongly anisotropic case, but you do not have any vortices, and then in this scenario, uh, obviously you can observe an algebraic decay and, and condensation. So if you then run the numerics hundreds of times, you see that this is an average number of vortices as a function of time. And in an isotropic case, it just converges to a constant. You, you always, it's a steady state. You always have vortices in the system, which destroy your, your phase coherence and lead to exponential decay. But with strong isotropic systems, all the vortices decay. But unfortunately, in strong isotropic scenario, uh, also the KPZ, um, um, if, if you exactly um, strong anisotropic, so it means that lambda x is equal exactly to minus lambda y, then uh, the KPZ terms becomes also non-relevant. So you're really back to the usual algebraic decay in a, in a kind of perfect condensate. So then we were uh, wondering, um, you know, okay, so KPZ again yeah, is not possible because in this in this limit is being destroyed by vortices, and in that limit is just just give universal behavior as in X, Y models, so nothing different than equilibrium condensation. Yeah? So either you have no condensation or you have something which is very similar to equilibrium. So actually getting this non-equilibrium capacity phase appears to be very difficult. Um, but we, we then thought that, okay, this is, this is a limit of very isotropic and this is limit on strong line isotropic. But maybe we can think of examples which can be somewhere in between. So not to induce such a strong anisotropy, but at the same time, not to be full isotropic. And perhaps we can, we can kind of reverse the, the scales in a way that the length scale for vortices will be larger than the length scale for KPZ and we can observe the, the KPZ behavior. So I, I won't go too much into details of the system, but, but basically um, a polaritons can, can be driven in a, in, in a variety of, of different ways. And one way is so-called optical parametric oscillator. So instead of driving the system incoherently, you can drive it coherently with a laser at an inflection point uh, here of the polariton special. This is a photon, exciton, lower and upper polaritons. Now, um, when, uh, when, when you drive strongly here, there is a spontaneous scattering to signal in either mode. So you form a condensate here, uh, which is now um, forming spontaneously. You still have a um, the spontaneous U1 symmetry breaking and gapless and diffusive Gaussian mode, like in a condensate, but uh, but the system is anisotropic because you're you're driving the the system. I mean, if, if you look at here, you you, you choose direction uh, for the pump, so for the your laser pump. So so the uh, the direction along with the pump is different than the direction perpendicular to the pump. So you you kind of introduce anisotropy. So, so now we derive um, again with Alex Zamora in another paper. We derived uh, um, a KPZ, uh, we derived an equation for the phase for this OPO condensate. So, OPO condensate, you have, uh, I don't want to go too much into the details of a Hamiltonian, but you have excitons, you have photons, you have um, dipole interaction between photons and excitons here, and then you have a drive and dissipation terms. And now you can um, assume that in the condensate only the uh, one one mode is gapless, so it's, it's only the the, the the kind of phase phase mode that uh, is, is only gapless Gaussian mode. Then all the other modes you can eliminate up to quadratic order, only keeping the Gaussian mode, so the the phase mode, the phase of the condensate uh, to all orders. So if you do that, you will derive equation which will happen to be exactly of the KPZ form. So that, that was nice to see that in despite its complications, you have a signal pump either the system is quite complex. But still, if you just care about the equation for the phase of the condensate, you will still have this form, which is the, the KPZ form. However, now the parameters of these equations can be very easily tuned just by changing the, the drive. So by changing the drive here, just, just, just the intensity of the drive, not even the direction. Uh, one, one is able to change quite substantially the, the anisotropy because this, this equation is already an effective an equation for the phase, which relates to the microscopic parameters in a way that this lambda x and lambda y, which are the parameters which are deciding about the strength of the KPZ nonlinearity, but also anisotropy. So how, how different is lambda x from lambda y? Will be purely decided by the strength of the interaction. So by, by, sorry, by the strength of the driving. So it's very easy to change. So if we will now um, look at this, this kind of cart, it's, it's a real phase diagram, but it just presents it 
uh, in a kind of cartoon way. So you have you can see everything. You you have a polarity on dispersion signal. Um, either here at Stone Photon, you drive the system, but as you drive, you follow the, the, those lines in a space, which on, on this axis, we have anisotropy. So how much, so it's like a ratio between lambda X, lambda Y, how, how much the system is anisotropic in, with respect to one and another spatial di dimension. And here, uh, noise. So, so there is a noise here, which is also, uh, the, the noise comes from the microscopic parameter of the microscopic model. Obviously this is a microscopic model. This is an effective theory. And we have, we, the parameters of this effective theory obviously have to be linked to this microscopic model. And, and you can see that if I pick up some, some case of parameters, <coughs> so these this three curves correspond to different detuning between excitons and photons. You can just drive the system with a bit different energy. Um, uh, like your um, detuning between your excitons and photons can be a bit different. Uh, then increasing the drive, you're moving along these curves in the phase space of anisotropy and noise. And, uh, and already we discovered that when one does that, one visits various interesting places in the phase diagram. So for example, here we have strong anisotropic scenario and you have algebraic order and the PKT transition to, um, to, to disorder phase. But here in, on, on this side, we have weakly anisotropic phase where hopefully we can, we can see the KPZ because this is, this is where, um, where the, um, I mean, here you, you, you cannot see KPZ because you have the purely algebraic order that uh, nonlinear terms are not relevant. But here, hopefully, in the weekly anisotropic uh, phase, we can find parameters where, uh, where this KPZ can be seen. So, so in particular, this is a phase diagram as a function of pump power and momentum of the drive. So it, I won't go into details. So the, the, the important point is that we found in this phase diagram, so this is a pump power, we found parameters, so G is a parameter, it's a very important parameter for the KPZ. So it sets the length scale where KPZ can be visible. And it, so basically if it's larger than one, then KPZ is visible in all length scale. So it dominates the physics. And we find a, a, a quite a narrow, but still non-zero um, range in the phase diagram where this G is larger than one. So we should really see KPZ physics thanks to anisotropy um, in this in, in this OPO uh, concept. So to confirm, so that was that was a field theory. So this 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 phase um, dynamics was derived using Keltish field theory. So you want to say, okay, this approximates. We approximate a lot, um, all other fluctuations, such as amplitude fluctuations. They're all treated to second order. It's only the phase which is treated to all order. So you might, you know, one can say it may not be correct. Maybe something else is happening. So we did again exact numerics for. Um, for, for, for these microscopic equations. And what we found is uh, that, so, so this is the phase diagram first, you increase the pump and you create a condensate. So you have a lower lower threshold and an upper threshold for the condensate. And here you have a condensate. And now we see, we, we take a cut, so these two black cuts to calculate the, the first order coherence function. And you see that when I take these two black uh, lines here, I have here a red, uh, green and blue. So the coherence is almost perfect. It's, it's, it's almost a perfect condensate. Theoretically, there is an algebraic decay of coherence, but it's on such a small, um, such a small um, exponent that is almost a constant. However, if I take this red um, line, which is supposed to be in, in the window of the K per set, you can see that my, co my decay coherence is much faster. And in fact, my condensate is stronger. So I would think uh, if anything, coherence here should be stronger than in, in case of, the, of, of, of these other two uh, cases. So already by eye, without even fitting anything, you could see, okay, something interesting is going on. Uh, you, you're taking a, a, a point which is not so far from, from that point, and all of a sudden you see a completely different behavior of G1, of the first order coherence in a condensate. If, and, and then when we fitted it, we were actually positively surprised that it actually fits very well a stretch exponential decay with an exponent of 0 0.39, where the universal one for KPZ is 0 0.37. Yes, so, uh, so we, were, we were kind of convinced that this is what's, what's happening, that, that is, the, is the KPZ um, physics. So we, we concluded with that, that using this uh, OPO driving, which is 
very possible in experiments. There are quite a number of experimental groups which are doing it. The KPZ should be within experimental reach. And we are now um, in, in a kind of discussion with experimentalists to, uh, to, to realize that. Um, so that's, that's a kind of summary of what, what I said before, that, uh, that KPZ scaling uh, phase in the, in, 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 is not possible for compact fields in 2D because of these vortices. Um, however, this polarity system is pretty much the only example of the possibility of seeing KPZ in 2D. The other examples are 1D. Um, however, it, is, it could be possible in finite size systems um, or as a transient, but uh, still uh, the estimates were pessimistic, so showing that the vortices will always appear, appear before KPZ. Um, however, if you engage anisotropy, which is possible practically in the OPO, you could actually uh, create conditions which are very feasible in, in current experiments, and that's what, what we are now advocating with these experiments. Okay, so, so now, um, uh, so, so that was a, a kind of one example where, uh, where uh, the kind of driven dissipative nature is dominant. So if I have a condensate with, without drive and dissipation, I won't be able to, to even think about uh, this kadar paris jean phase. It's a, it's a purely non-equilibrium phenomenon. So um, now let's see whether we see some other things which are, which are different. So now, if I now look at, not 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 away from the from the critical point, but kind of closer to the critical point where I actually have vortices. So KPZ was kind of moving moving away from the critical point and trying to see whether I, we can see uh, the KPZ physics before I have an algebraic decay or before the vortices uh, uh, destroy the phase. But if I if I tune exactly to the critical point, obviously I have vortices and I can observe what kind of behavior they uh, they show. So um. So we know uh, we know that in two dimensions, in two dimension, the um, transition between condensed or non-condensed or order and disorder is not only about condensation; it's also in magnetic system like in ferromagnetism, for example. Um, so whenever you have two-dimensional system which crosses from order to disorder, uh, the transition is driven uh, by the binding and unbinding of vortices. So you have vortex and vortex pairs which in a order phase bind and annihilate and in the disorder phase proliferate. So for that, as we know, it was 2016 Nobel Prize for, uh, for the, to, to one, to, 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 um, um, to the, <clears throat> I mean, not, not only for that, it was, was in general for topological phase transitions, but among them the, for the PGT transition. So obviously these transitions were uh, looked at mainly in electronic systems or in cold atoms. But BKT for photons was not really um, realized until 2017 in experiments. So that was a collaboration between our theory group and, and our experimental collaboration in, Le in, in Lecce. So as you uh, change the drive, so here obviously you are not changing temperature like in, 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 in equilibrium uh, scenarios, but you, you're changing the, the intensity of the drive. So you're changing the density of particles in the system. Uh, you can move uh, from lots of vortices, then they start pairing, they start forming pairs, and then finally uh, you, you don't have uh, any vortices. Yeah? So you, you, you cross according to this BKT scenario. And moreover, in the experiment, they also observe algebraic decay of correlations, which was exactly the same for space and time and, and was smaller than one quarter, which is also a feature of equilibrium. So uh, this, those samples and those lifetimes were long enough and the situation was almost ideal in that case and they could, they could realize um, a kind of equilibrium BKT, but for light. Yes, yeah, so it was a first realization for, for light. But now, um, obviously we want to, we want to look at, um, okay, is it, is, it, is it exactly the same? Like, let, let's say, are there any other features which we can see which are not the same as in equilibrium? So yes, we, we saw quite a number of, of other features. For example, in equilibrium, there is this uh, strict upper bound that the exponent of the coherent cannot be larger than one quarter. Um, and this is connected with, um, with the fact that you, um, once, um, once the vortices start proliferating, then you jump immediately to the exponential decay of correlation and the power law uh, um, correlations are bound by this, uh, by, this, by, this, by this kind of universal one, one over four exponent. 
However, out of equilibrium, this situation didn't hold anymore. You could actually observe much higher exponents. Even we observe up to 1.2 in both in experiments and in theory. And this is um, kind of connected with the fact that in equilibrium, everything equilibrates. So the, the sound modes and vortices, they are connected by the same temperature. Whereas out of equilibrium, various degrees of freedom are disconnected. So you could have no vortices, so still algebraic decay of correlations, because if there are no vortices, you will have algebraic decays of exponential decay, but uh, still you could have some kind of like an over overshaken condensate. So the condensate which don't have vortices, so it's still algebraic, but it, it can it can accumulate more sound modes, more collective excitation. So at some point we would call, call it uh, uh, shaken but not steered. Yeah. So you, you don't have you don't have vortices, but you have more collective excitation than in equilibrium, and you can go over that. So that was that was a difference. But but we also recently this is work in progress. We, it's still not published. But when you look at components, obviously the light matter system are always multi-component. Uh, so uh, in, in the case of polaritons, you have photons and excitons, and you also have the signal and idler if you if you drive um, across the OPO. So we found that this, if you look at separately different components, that the transition is happening at the same at the same point. Yes, so the the BKT transition is happening at the same point. This is a number of vortices as a function of pump power. But the number of vortices is very different for, for, for different components, and especially photonic idler has a lot of vortices in the in an order phase, where obviously the other components have all has practically zero vortices. So it's a it's a kind of an interesting, unusual behavior when you have a, a condensate which still have a free vortices in the system. So we, we computed G1, so so all the all the components will have exactly the same G1, so, so algebraic decay of correlation with the same exponent, so you have a condensate, but at the same time we see these free vortices in the, in the idler. And uh, when we look at correlations between vortices um, as a function of pump power, we see that indeed, so, so something which here um, is it, a correlation between, a, between two vortices. So if it's um, if it just has this two peak structure and zero here, you, you, you have very tightly bound vortex anti vortex pairs. But if you go to a situation where you have this non zero offset, it means that you have free vortices in the system, vortices which are just lumbering around and, and you have a correlation, not only localized to, to a pair, but you have correlations between uh, those those free vortices as well. So, so we, uh, we see that if I look at those uh, signal photon components, um, if I'm in an order state, um, all my vortices are bound. But if I look at the idler state, I see free vortices in the system. At the same time, signal pump and idler are locked in other phase fluctuations. So I see algebraic decay of correlations. So, um, so in some sense, it's a, it's a new state. So, so far, it was never observed in equilibrium where you could have algebraic decay of coherence, you can have superfluidity, but at the same time you have these free vortices in the system. So that was that was this is something which is which is which is again very specific to to non-equilibrium uh, scenario. So new state algebraic order with unbound vortices is, is something which has not been seen before. Um, similarly, um, if you want to complicate matters even further, which the real experiment would be, so um, you, you could think of, okay, I have this condensate, I have this polariton condensate, but sometimes in some experiments, this condensate is not decoupled from, from the drive. So if you, if you drive the system first, you drive excitons, you'll have some kind of reservoir of particles which are incoherent. So you have a condensate coupled to some incoherent population of particles. Um, which usually doesn't happen in atomic condensates or in some other equilibrium systems. Um, so then um, a phenomenology of such a system is again has quite new complexity because you have a you have a coherent field. So if you think of that as a kind of gross pitayeski equation for the uh, for the condensate, but it's coupled to a classical field as well, which has its own dynamics. And then what we see is that as you increase drive. Um, the superfluidity first forms in the puddles, so, the, so you have a condensate forming in the puddles first, and then only later there is a discontinued jump into the uniform condensate. So we observe 
the kind of two transitions. First, you have a second order transition to form a convex set, and even BKT transition within these puzzles. But then you have a first order transition into the common set, which can be shown like if you compute various observables, such as number of vortices, density, correlation length, it's like almost, uh, almost uh, ideal. This is, these are simulations, but it's almost ideal jump um, characteristic of a first order transition. And moreover, we see cases where you have a coexistence of uh, this puddled common set and completely uniform common set. So this is another feature of a first order transition. It's like water and ice. They coexist at zero temperature. You have a coexistence of one phase and another phase. It's a characteristic of first order phase transition. And here the same, we see cases where the uniform, and there is nothing here. We pump the system uniformly. There is absolutely nothing to give this um, you know, circle. That we don't pump it in, with a circle. We pump it completely uniformly. And yet the system somehow phase separates and creates a bubble of this puddle condensate and then another region with a completely uniform common set. So it's, it's a really um, characteristic of, of, the, of the first order phase transition, which is different to BKT. But then when we look inside the puddle, so before that phase transition is happening, we see the original BKT transition within the puddles. So, so it's, it's a quite, a quite a rich, um, rich behavior, which um, actually thanks to referees of that paper, we find there's a lot of analogies to, 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 to many, um, classical systems, such as the, 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 the um, behavior is almost analogous to a physics model of flocking of self-propelled particles, such as birds or fish. Uh, they also uh, kind of first um, form a disorder state, but when they order, they, firm f uh, they first form pattern, and only after they go to the kind of completely uniform state. So there, there has been quite a lot of uh, analogies and also the equations are well, one, could, one could even draw analogies between equations. So, so when when you go from disorder to order, but by a pattern formation, and um, also coexistence of first order and BKT has been shown in XY models where you have a, a kind of a theta dependent interaction. So if the interactions are not simple, but they are they, they depend on, on 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 the variable which undergoes condensation, then um, then something like that has all, all also been, been seen, and, and also Griffin phases in dilute ice and ferroabundance. So, similarly, there was an observation of partial order in each of mutually disconnected islands, and only after a kind of second type of transitions, it, it went to a uniform, um, uniform ordered state. So, this is, this is all light, but it has quite a lot of analogies to, to, to various other systems. Um, because of the coupling and the ingredient, the important ingredient is that you couple coherent fields, so you couple a condensate to some incoherent population, and they both have their own dynamics, and these dynamics compete to, to form this kind of spatial pattern, although the drive is completely uniform and nothing else in the system is not uniform, yeah, everything is uniform. And so the, the uh, other topic, which is very non-equilibrium again, and, and is something which do not exist in equilibrium condensate, is a, a question of superfluidity in the system. So if you take the, the classic superfluids, like liquid helium, uh, we know very well from our undergraduate studies that what, what it means to be superfluid, well, you have no viscosity, that's, that's one thing. You have, um, also you, you, you generate, quantized vortices, yes, so you, we know you, you can take a bucket of helium and rotate and you create vortices there, or if you take cold atoms, you rotate them, you create vortices there. You can also inject metastable persistent flow. So obviously if you have a superfluidity or superconductivity, you can engineer the flow to last forever. But the real, I, I put it in red because the real definition of, of a superfluid is that it doesn't have a transverse response. So if you take a superfluid and you want it to rotate superfluid, the superfluid will not rotate. Yes, you will just do nothing. And if you start rotating it too fast, you, you, will, you will start generating the vortices, but you will, the superfluid itself will not rotate. That's the definition of a superfluid. And this comes from the fact that superfluid is described by the microscopic wave function uh, with a well-defined phase. And we know that the rotation of the, uh, of the gradient is zero. So it's mathematically proven that superfluid cannot rotate. So the, the most fundamental definition of superfluid fraction was 
uh, okay, let's compute the response to rotation and let's uh, compute the response to pushes. And then let's see what the difference is. So the difference will be the superfluid fraction because if, if my system is, is, is a normal fluid, you will have the same response whether I want to turn it or whether I want to push it. Whereas if my system is superfluid, it will not respond to trying to be turned, but it will respond to trying to be pushed yeah, forwards or backwards. So the, the classic definition in, in any of cold atoms books is what is the superfluid fraction is the difference between, between pushing and steering. Yeah? So, so in, in, in kind of more mathematical words, uh, is a difference between longitudinal and transverse responses. Yes. Yeah? So um, if I, I mean, this, this is just a kind of intuitive way of imagining that if I put a superfluid between two sheets and I put a force uh, perpendicular, obviously superfluid or normal fluid would respond to that. But if I put um, my superfluid between two sheets and I try to kind of apply a shear force, it will not, superfluid will not respond, but normal fluid would. So if I calculate the difference, I will know the superfluid fraction. That's, that's the kind of uh, uh, most fundamental definition of superfluid density, is the difference between longitudinal and transverse responses as uh, SQ goes to zero. So obviously when you calculate the, the current current response function, it's a function of momentum. But the, if you want to calculate the, the fractions of the density, you take Q goes to zero. So in the limit of Q going to zero, the, the difference between the two. Uh, so now polaritons have been obviously looked at from the point of view of whether there are superfluids or whether something else is happening there. And especially this, this paper, the experimental papers in 2009 was using coherent drive. So, so driving the system just with a laser um, across some obstacle. And they observed um, kind of well, if you drive it weakly, um, it emits Cherenkov waves. If you drive it strongly, uh, it, it doesn't. So, uh, so you have like here is a, it's a kind of larger density condensate, here is a smaller density condensate. So, here is if you're in a superfluid regime, here you're not like in the classic um, uh, liquid helium or, or atom BC. So, how did they describe that now? So, if I just take the the very simple uh, model, so uh, just bosons, like let's say I even forget about exciton photon component, I just take them as bosons with some interaction, with some kinetic energy, with some dissipation here, and some drive, some coherent drive. So now the fact that the drive is coherent, uh, it was very important because it was opening a gap in the system. So the, the, the spectrum, uh, you, you see the real and imaginary part of the excitation spectrum, which you can compute. This is just linear response you can compute. And you could see that the, the system is always gapped because even in, in some cases, I, I highlighted this red case, it looked like it's gapless because the real part goes to zero, but there is imaginary part which is finite. So, but, but experimentally it's kind of naively look, okay, if we, have, if we are in this case, let's ignore this imaginary part that is zero, but the, the, the real part goes to goes to zero at the origin, so the system should be superfluid by the kind of simple uh, Landau uh, criteria of, of superfluidity because it's gapless. However, uh, what what uh, again my, my other student who uh, already graduated in 2018, um, uh, Richard Juggins, um, actually uh, said, okay, I mean that's that's not a really good explanation. Just to look at the real part where there is also imaginary part of the spectrum. So let's compute. Let's really take a brute force and with Kelly's field theory because it's non-equilibrium it has a drive and dissipation, so it has to be non-equilibrium. Let's compute the longitudinal and transverse responses. And he found out, as kind of we expected, because if the system is gapped, uh, we expected that's going to happen. But after um, after careful calculations, he computed that indeed is zero. So the system is not superfluid. But he found something something perhaps even more interesting. So he found that the difference is always zero. So, so this, the, the coherent driven system was not superfluid. I have to stress that this is about coherent driven. Incoherent driven or OPO, which I was showing earlier, might be superfluid. But those those experiments which claim superfluidity were using coherent drive in, in that case, and they were claiming superfluidity. So we argued that. The system was not superfluid, but he found something else that he found that in some cases, actually the difference is zero, but they also individually go to zero. So you have no response whatsoever. So you, you don't have superfluid fraction, but you don't have a normal fraction either. So the system has no superfluidity, but it has a non, not normal component at all. So you, you behave like a rigid state, behave like a solid. 
you know, if, if you take a solid and you, you, you do a linear response, obviously it's not like a fluid, even if you push it or want to steer it will, to just small perturbation will not respond. Yeah? So we found that the system, despite being a liquid, it's actually more like a solid in terms of the response to long-term transverse forces on the fluid state. So we, we found this rigid state, we call it a rigid state because you see that, that it doesn't have a normal response it's in some conditions. Obviously, when you increase KP or if you increase density, you will have some of the normal response, but not all of the density will respond. So you will have like a rigid fraction and the, and the, and the fluid fraction there. So, so we, we call it a rigid state, which is a dis if you rotate the fluid, it will just rotate. If you rotate the superfluid, we'll put vortices, but this rigid state just won't do anything. Yeah, it's something else. So you was, um, so, but then we, we asked, okay, so how can we actually explain the experiments? They still didn't see any, any um, scattering for some conditions. So we, we tuned the parameters to the experimental conditions and, and we are changing the, um, the density. And we found that this response, so the normal, so the superfluid response is always zero, but the normal response also passes through zero for some conditions. And we found that it exactly passes to zero where the spectrum has this form. So where they thought that it was superfluid because it had a zero, uh, it had a gapless um, uh, imaginary part, but a uh, real part, but gapless imaginary part. So this explains that they were able to see no scattering because if there is no any response, so the, the kind of superfluid fraction is zero, but the normal fraction is also zero, the, the, the system is completely rigid, then obviously there's no scattering, but this is not a superfluid ph phenomena, it's some other phenomena. So this, this story was actually quite, was picked up by, by new scientists and it was just the, their expression of, of this rigid state, like a new state of matter, which is a, which is a liquid, but it behaves in a very rigid way, like a frozen river, like a frozen liquid that you cannot steer it or or or, or you cannot do anything to it, although although it's a liquid. Um, so in the, in the last um, two minutes, I have I have two more minutes. I just I just briefly mentioned. I won't go into much details how you can now load those fluids into the lattices. So that, that's a new area of research altogether. So it's possible for the experimentalists to grow these structures. This is, I won't need to go into details how they do it, but it's possible to do it. There are perhaps only two or three labs in the world which are able to do it. The one which we collaborate with is, is in Paris, Jacqueline Bloch uh, um, um, labs where, where, they can, where they can make those uh, honeycomb lattices. And in particular, it's possible to make honeycomb lattice with a strain. So this is a normal honeycomb lattice, and then this is a honeycomb lattice with a strain. So you see that in one direction, you have a different distance between these micro pillars. And you grow this micro you, you grow the two-dimensional sample, and then you edge the micro pillars by hand. This is micrometer scale. So you, it's like a it's like a graphene, but enhanced. Yes, it's like a zoomed, zoomed in graphene. It's much easier to to experiment on it because this, the, the lens scales are much much larger and there is there are no defects so you know in, in any solid state system you have defects here not because you really it's on the micron scale you really can edge those exactly without any dislocation or without any defect and you can just make different distances in this direction and this corresponds to strain you, you, like putting strain or so the it's kind of the, the this this micro pillars are simulating graphene, but strain in graphene in turn is simulated magnetic field. Yeah, you, 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 may, you may have heard that if you have a strain graphene, you'll be like, um, uh, like, like a magnetic field in the sample. And, and why this is interesting is because firstly, polaritons will not respond very well to real magnetic field because they're charge neutral, but moreover, you can create a, a synthetic magnetic fields which are very strong because you can just almost arbitrarily change the gradient. Yes, yeah, so if, if your sample is large, you can change the gradient of this uh, strain. So how fast um, the thing change as a function of X direction arbitrarily. And this translates into the strength of the magnetic field. So you can create magnetic fields which are impossible in nature to create very strong magnetic field. And, and, and then this, this also corresponds to if you have a um, atomic cone and you start rotating it, um, that would correspond to a very fast rotation. So again, you cannot rotate um, uh, atomic BC very fast. 
you can rotate it only up to certain amount. But here you can simulate either very strong magnetic field, something which almost cannot be created, or you can simulate a very strong rotation in contactons just by changing the distance in these microcleavers. So why this is interesting, obviously, where are we going with that? Obviously, we're going to, towards fractional quantum hole because they try to see qu a fractional quantum hole with atomic BC by rotating, but they are not able to rotate fast enough to see fractional quantum hole. The same in other systems, it's very difficult to see fractional quantum hole uh, apart from the original electronic systems. But here, if you, if you take the, uh, the, uh, this, this straight graphene, you see lambda levels. So you, you see uh, states which are corresponding to lambda levels in this magnetic field. And now if you start driving the system, Uniformly, what we observe, so actually Cristobal, so my, my other student who is now in Canada, observed, um, it's now actually published, I, I should have updated the, the reference, is that you, you, we drive uniformly, but if we drive in a kind of small, sum, small in a small region, you just obtain a condensation like that. But if you drive in a larger region, you see that the, the system condenses in a rotating state. So you have a vortex here, we, we drive uniformly, there is, there is no vorticity to be driven, but it, the system is condensing into the rotating state. If you drive on the larger area, uh, you, you, you create even more vortices. So obviously here, the system didn't condense into this rotating state because there was no enough space. The vortex is uh, characterized by magnetic length and magnetic length is characterized by this, uh, you know, strain, depending on, I, I didn't write the Hamiltonians for, for that, not, not to confuse, but basically, this strain will translate to magnetic field, and the magnetic field will obviously translate to magnetic length, which will be characteristic for vortices. So the system is automatically condensing into the Landau level, and the Landau level, the ground state, is already rotating. Yeah? So it's not that I've created a condensate and then I have to rotate it. No, the system is condensing already into the state, which is a vortex lattice, rotating vortex lattice. So it automatically is condensing into this Landau level. Which, which was nice to see. I mean, this, this is in, 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 in simulations. And, um, and in experiments, they are so far able to see. So they're able to see the spectra. They're able to obviously create the, the strain graphene. They're able to see the spectra. They're able to create the condensate, but they were not yet able to see this effect due to some technicalities. I will not even go into details because obviously in a real system, you have some other problems, some other effects which are competing and they have to first get rid of these effects, but they are, they are working toward, toward this conversation. So, so in, in some sense, you have a, um, you're condensing in a state like BC in rotating trap, but with potentially with a very strong rotation. And uh, one thing different is that obviously, if you take a BC and you start rotating, you give a, a direction of the rotation uh, yourself. Or if you put a magnetic field, you have a direction for the magnetic field yourself. Here, the system has two options. You can condense either in this state, plus one, or, or, or in this state. So it will correspond to condensing in a state with magnetic field BZ or minus BZ. Yes, so it's spontaneously breaking the value symmetry. So it's spontaneously choosing to condense either something of equivalent of magnetic field B or something equivalent to magnetic field minus B. So it's additional, there's additional symmetry breaking, which is interesting, it's, it's new, it's, it's not something which uh, normally one can see. So, so basically, as, as I said, spontaneous breaking of value symmetry, which is basically breaking by spontaneously time reversal symmetry. Um, again, something not observed in, in, in any other systems. And moreover, if you drive even on a larger scale, you could see coexistence. So you can see uh, one condensate rotating in one way and another in the opposite way. So occupying this or that those states. Um, okay, so I will I will skip um, I will skip the final part. So final part was just okay. How are we modeling the system? And in in our group, we developed two type of methods: phase space methods and tensor network methods. It's, uh, a lot of these methods we just we developed uh, in house, and we have codes to to do them. I will I will not bore you with the details. But um, I will just um, show that especially, uh, um, especially Connor, who now left the group, developed very nice tensor network method, which is able to treat driven dissipative um, two-dimensional systems. So it's a first, first working algorithm for drive dissipation and 2D. There, there were obviously um, 
uh, algorithm for drive anticipation in 1D or two-dimensional, but without drive anticipation. But drive anticipation 2D was text to corner. Uh, we have now the codes working in the group and, and kind of within those codes. So we have, we have, we have um, I, I didn't go into details, but we have more kind of stochastic methods such as truncated Fignal, positive P, uh, which work in a different areas of parameters. And we have tensor networks, which work, work in a um, kind of um, contemporary, uh, like, um, I mean, that, that overall we can, uh, we can uh, describe the whole phase space. So here is the drive, so drive in the unit of interaction. Here is dissipation in the unit of interaction. So if we have a systems which are very strongly interacting and very weakly driven or very uh, with very weak dissipation, we can use tensor networks. If we have systems which have either, which have, for example, the strong drive, um, we, we use truncated Wigner. And if we have systems which have weak drive, but strong dissipation, then it's positive P. And overall in the group, we have basically developed these methods to be able to, to treat various, various problems. So just to summarize, uh, I think um, I convince you that within this light matter setting, we can generate states which are uh, interesting that they're not just repetition of what has been done in cold atoms or in liquid helium or in some other um, equilibrium condenses, but really non-trivial phases would not exist in other settings. So we, we, the answer to this question is yes. And I briefly, very briefly, just to give a flavor, I, I know it's very difficult in a, in a short talk to, to describe everything, but I, I just named at least five different examples of, uh, of phenomena which cannot exist in equilibrium. They're all, they're all features of this driven dissipative nature uh, of the, of the, sorry, of the um, kind of photonic condensates. So our work is mainly set in the context of polaritons, semiconductor polaritons, but a lot of what we do is universal. So it can also apply to atoms in cavities, circuit TV systems, photon VC, and, and any kind of, it, just the important ingredient that you have photons which are interacting via, via some um, matter component and then they dissipate and they have to be replenished from the other side and provided this is satisfied, there are various experimental realizations which, which can be considered. And so far the, the most advanced one are semiconductors um, because they can, they can do 1D, they can do 2D, they can also do lattices. So they already went into, into the lattice systems as well as, uh, as just um, two-dimensional <clears throat> and one-dimensional cases. Okay, I'm sorry I overrun a little, and um, I thank you very much for, for your attention. No problem. We are flexible with time. Uh, so are there questions, comments? I can see some of them already coming. So thank you so much for your talk. Um, also, I will make an announcement that we are now starting to organize Quantum Battles in Atom Science 2023. So if there is a theme you would like to have addressed, which is a bit controversial and a bit trendy, drop us an email at quantumbattles at gmail.com and do let us know. We have our own ideas, but we always look for suggestions. And our first question is uh, from Che Patterson from Manchester. Thanks, great talk. Perhaps I missed this, but can you estimate or measure any of the critical exponents of the unconventional BKT transition? Do they agree with the conventional case? Okay, so um, so I didn't talk too much about the critical exponents because we did works which I didn't show here. Uh, we did quenches, yes. So we did um, we look at Kibujorek mechanism. Uh, where I, um, sorry, I'm just trying to at least reach the relevant side. So, so we did quenches across the transition, and from those we were able to uh, to get the critical exponents, to the dynamical critical exponents. I didn't talk about that, and those were the same as in equilibrium. So the the the, the difference here was that this upper bound. So normally. The algebraic decay has an upper bound. Algebraic decay in equilibrium is given by temperature over density of, of superfluid density, and it has an upper bound of one fourth, 0 0.25. Here, 
this doesn't hold anymore. So you could have higher, even as I said, the largest we met, we, we obtained was 1.2. So really much higher than, than 0 0.25. The, the, the dynamical exponents were the same. So the difference here was, was that, that you don't have this upper bound. And also in looking at various components, we found this uh, behavior when you had a coexistence of algebraic order and free vortices in, in the idea. So that, that was kind of surprising because usually when you have free vortices, you have exponential decay. But I could kind of imagine that in a way that if you have multi-components and the other components are um, ordered and then another one is much weaker, so it supports vortices, but at the same time is locked to those components which do not support vortices because they are they have a very strong density then you then it's like like putting raisins on a cake that you have this perfect cake uh, which which is perfect because because this idler component is coupled to those other components um, in the, in the, in a condensate via um, kind of this OPO scattering so the the phase modes are locked but at the same time, this idler component has a very low density, so it supports vortices, but the vortices are not able to destroy the order at larger distances because those areas are coupled to the other uh, component. I, I kind of imagine that that way. So that was the difference, obviously, that in equilibrium that's not possible because in equilibrium you, you, you don't have this uh, kind of coexistence of these various uh, components which one could be strong, one could be weak, but at the same time they're coupled by a scattering and, and it, it's a kind of more complicated concept. So this was different and the, the upper bound, but the critical exponents of the, the dynamical critical exponents were the same in case of this BKT, what, what we observed when we did quenches um, across the transition. Thanks very thing. much. So uh, is that clear? You can you can pursue the the question if you wish. You can ask further. Uh, no, thanks very much. That was that was that was quite comprehensive. Okay, thank you. Um, one thing that came to my mind, okay, coming from someone from a different area, totally. First was the driving because you mentioned when you put some driving that you get some asymmetry, and that either it's too asymmetrical, and then you have something that reaches some kind of equilibrium, or if you don't have any driving, you have the symmetric case, and that's more or less what you expect. So in terms of parameters, what would be then your ideal intermediate driving for which you would have this non-equilibrium situation? So, yeah, this is like when you had this equation, very beginning. Yeah, yes, yes, so, so, so basically, I had, yeah, this one. I, had, I had this OPO equation and we changed the drive strength because that's that's what they can do in experiments. So they, they, they put the laser mm -hmm. and they can tune the laser. And then you, you have some microscopic uh, models which you can map to, to the KPZ equation for the phase. And by changing the drive, you are changing these parameters. Mm -hmm. So then if you want, depends what you want to obtain, obviously. Um, if you change the drive, you're moving in this phase diagram. So if you want to have algebraic decay and the classical BKT, you might want to be in this region. If you want something else, you might be in another region. But we were interested in this Kadar Paris Jean phase because that's something which, especially statistical physicists and mathematicians are really interested. Mm -hmm. And so far, there are no experiments in 2D. They can only, whatever they calculate, they can only check in 1D, all, all of these other physical examples. That could be the first example in 2D. So okay. they're really interested, the mathematicians, in, 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 in that, like completely from a different field than polaritons. So we, we obtain that here, that this is a pump, this is a drive. So it's like a one cut in that. Um, so you, I'm changing the drive along here, increasing the drive. And the blue is parameter G. And parameter G is that uh, the larger G, the better it is if you want to observe KPZ because it sets the length scale. So if G is uh, to 10 to minus two, and this is an exponent. So the length scale is exponent G. So if it's small, then the length scale are so massive that you, 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 you never be able to see it in real experiment. So you, you really want to have G of the order of one or larger than one. So we could see there is this window, yes. 
and uh, and if you zoom into this window, that's basically the window of the of the pump strength. So this is this is the whole phase diagram from the beginning. If you drive, you first create a condensate. Then if you drive too strongly, you finally kill it. Yeah. So this is the the whole phase diagram. So this this interesting region will be somewhere here in the middle, here around this red curve, which which is basically um, here uh, in pink. So it, it requires some tuning. But you know, experimentalists can tune the pump power. That, that's not so difficult. So, so that's the currently what we are trying to. Uh, we are collaborating with Sheffield, experimenting Sheffield, uh, and in Paris, uh, that that they are interested to, to to explore. This this range of of pump power, so that so that to, to see that behavior. Okay. So thank you. This looks like then an optimization problem that you really need to get the conditions correct. Uh, well, but no, it's only the it's only the pump power. Pump. Yes, because mm -hmm. obviously, obviously, if you have different change different parameters, then of course your other parameters will be different. But in the experiment, you cannot really like if you have a given experiment, you cannot really change other parameters. You cannot change the mass of the photon. You cannot change the Pump power is the only parameter you can change. So you, so you just have to search with the pump power um, around that region to, to hopefully find it. Obviously, if you have a different parameter, then this range in pump powers will be different. But in a given sample, pump power is the only thing they can change. Yeah, they cannot change anything else in, in a given sample. If they can grow a different sample, then, then you have a bit different parameters of, of these microscopic parameters like mass, Exit on interactions, uh, dipole coupling. This can all be changed, but not um, not within the same experiment. Yes, they can, they can grow a different sample, and then you have a different omega r, or you have a different mass. But the thing which can be changed very easily is the pump power. So then, seeing something as a function of pump power, which you can that, that's quite a nice thing because that they can tune. So so these curves, like red curve or blue curve or green curve, is increasing the pump power and you can visit as you increase the pump power you can go to different phases and then they can do it yeah because that's not so difficult obviously they have to be precise and they have to watch and measure but it's just increasing or decreasing pump power okay thank you yeah it sounds it sounds really interesting are there further questions uh, the other question that I had was you mentioned the environment, that the environment was doing things that you didn't expect and that you had to put in your equations uh, a contribution of the environment. And uh, what exactly are you taking into consideration? Because I understand that it's supposed to destroy a lot of phases, right? Yes. Yeah, so so no, 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 without the environment, you wouldn't even have KPZ. Yeah? So that, um, this equation here, Mm -hmm. If I don't have drive and dissipation, I won't have even those terms. I will have an equilibrium condensate. So all of that is, is very sensitive to the environment, obviously. And uh, microscopically, we model it as a decay. So photons decay, that's the usual buff of harmonic oscillators. Yes, is you, you just couple your, your psi field to some external buff of oscillator for decay. And then you have a drive, which is F, which is a drive. Um, in the system, and then you do the field theory. That's why you always have to be in equilibrium. You have to be mm -hmm. either Kelsey field theory, or if we do some numerics, it always has to be the truncated linear or positive. It has to be non equilibrium because we always have a drive and dissipation. There is no um, uh, way out because, uh, because the system has to be sustained. But at the same time, if you didn't have those terms, so this is what I was trying to like uh, say in the beginning that. If you didn't have drive and dissipation, you won't. You will lose those pink terms, mm -hmm. and then you just back to the, the usual diffusion equation, like in XY model, which is characteristic for atomic BC condensates or um, you know anything in equilibrium. Anything in equilibrium will not have the uh, the pink terms, but the pink terms are the interesting terms. So if you want to see something different than equilibrium, so the the, the drive uh, gives you those terms. Okay, thank you so much. So thank you so much for joining. I wish you a great summer. And uh, we'll be back in September.
And if you would like to talk to our speaker, Professor Mazena Simanska, just hang in there. I would like to thank her as well and all the Autofridays team for organizing uh, the seminars and the series. Uh, and we see you in September. So bye you to people.